as a planet we're throwing away more than ever before. And here in California, it's the front line of the global war on waste. Welcome to the Mega Landfill, one of the biggest destinations for our trash in the world. Up top, boss, go ahead. Dealing with nearly a million trash bags worth of garbage every day. Not a good smell. Like a guy uh, not going in the shower for a month or so. So what does it take to tackle this tidal wave of trash? With exclusive access, we go behind the scenes and spill the secrets of this super site. This machine detects the radiation. Meet the troops on the front line battling the bin juice. I see a horse, a big horse. It wasn't the bean. The mighty machines that move mountains of muck. As you can feel beneath us, the ground shaking, it's not solid. The landfill's constantly settling. And the pioneering tech taking trash into the future. So there it goes. So where we're standing right now, we're going to be 100 feet below trash. Welcome to Secrets of the Mega Landfill. The hills of Orange County in California. A gentle, peaceful place far away from any signs of bustle and bustle. Well, maybe not. This is Frank R. Bowerman Landfill. The last place you'd think to find one of the biggest landfill sites in the world. Every day, this 725-acre site faces the challenge of dealing with 8,500 tonnes of trash. It might be out of sight, out of mind when it's dumped on the curb, but it's just the start of an extraordinary journey into the afterlife of junk never seen before. Five thirty a.m., and with cities all across the state about to wake up and put out millions of trash cans, there's no time to waste at the landfill site. Every night, the trash from the day before is put to bed under nearly two thousand feet of covers that must be taken off before any more can get in. They are 40 feet wide by 150 feet long, and there's usually two tarps per spool. Overseeing this mammoth task is Landfill Operations Superintendent Greg. Adrian, can you make a pass for that water truck over here by the landing where we're working? We used to cover it with six inches of dirt. By replacing that dirt with tarps, it preserves that space where dirt used to consume. We're able to put trash right on top of trash. And boy, there's a lot of trash. Below Greg's feet is a massive lined sink full of garbage that reaches an epic 450 feet down, enough to bury the Statue of Liberty one and a half times over. In charge of one of these giant machines is Javier, or Big Cat to his friends. You want to grab the engine? Yeah, that'll give them time to move uh, the other spools out of the way. In less than 90 minutes, Big Cat and the rest of the team must have the site ready. Otherwise, there will be chaos at the gates when hundreds of garbage trucks arrive. In just one day, America alone chucks away 60 million plastic bottles, 220,000 tons of packaging, and 38 million plastic bags. It's the tip of the iceberg of a mind-boggling amount of trash. But we all know where it ends up, don't we? 
it's just like a giant hole that's on fire and all the garbage goes in there to waste. Um. I have no idea what they do with the trash. I don't know if they burn it or they bury it. I have no idea. They don't just leave the trash there, do they? Orange County is home to three million people, each one chucking on average one ton of waste a year. You may not know where it all ends up, but one guy sure does. David is part of a hundred strong fleet on a mission to clean up the streets. And he can't be late for the landfill. I've been doing it for like almost 15 or 16 years. And the trash never ends. But it's good. Not complaining. Today, he must stop at more than 500 homes. But to speed things up, there's some heavy tech to lend a helping claw. We just press the button, the arms goes out to get the barrel and put it up, down. It's like a little robot doing the job. But you have to have a lot of practice to not put a car into the sidewalk. Run, lady, run! Run. Although it's not just normal household waste that finds its way into David's garbage truck. I was digging one of those uh, the restaurant beans, the big ones, and one lady was behind me waving the hand. Hey, hey, hey. She was like, oh my God. In that bean you dumped right now, there was a horse. But I, that was like a, a rocking horse, you know, like those for little kids. Like, and then I asked, well, they, well, you want the horse or it? No, 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 not the rocking horse. The, I mean, a real horse. What do you mean, like, like a horse, horse? She said, she said, yes. While David keeps an eye out for random garbage, back at the landfill, the minutes are counting down until the gates are open. 10-4. And there's a big problem. No, it's not spending or nothing. Some things happen unplanned. Right now, we have a tarp machine that went down. With the tarp machine out of action, the day could end before it's begun. And there's already dozens of garbage trucks waiting to get in. There's an electrical problem, an electrical problem. Luckily, a team of seven mechanics are on site to deal with emergencies. They fix the tarp machine and Big Cat can get back on the job. Turn four. To make up the lost time, it's all hands on deck. This is just a small portion of the operation. There's a lot of things that happen day to day behind the scenes that people aren't aware of to help keep a large landfill like this moving. At the front gate, 40 garbage trucks from all over Southern California are now in line to get in. It's up to Supervisor Mimi to keep everything under control. This is the front line. They come from a long way, so to avoid the traffic, so they come here before the opening time. And once uh, they come in, I don't want them to run me over. <laughs> Once Mimi has given the OK, there's no holding back the swarm. And these trucks are on the clock. They need to offload and get back out to collect more waste as fast as possible. Trash waits for no man. As you can see, they're really fast. Yes. Every haulage company must pay on behalf of their customers to unleash their loads, depending on how much they're carrying. And the only way to figure that out, 
it's time for a weigh-in on a mega scale. This is not a row. This is the scale all the way to that strip over there. These giant scales are 70 feet long, the length of the longest truck. And where there's trash, there's cash. The regular customer, they pay $59 per ton. With as many as 750 trucks arriving from morning till night, Mimi can easily take a staggering quarter of a million dollars every day. And next to arrive, with his 12 tons of trash, is garbage hauler David. Enjoy the view, because we're going to be all the way on top. And what a view. This massive area looks like a big crater, but under all this dirt is trash. And the active part of this site, covered this morning with Greg's gigantic tarps, is now covered in trucks. I hope this thing he doesn't give up in the middle of the way. <laughs> and what goes up must come down. You have to be really careful about the way down because uh, the brakes. The brakes get burned, they get hot. Easy does it, David. We're going good, normal, normal temperature. The road is conquered. But with several trucks already in front of him, there's the risk of a traffic jam on the trash. Bring it in, boss! But not on this man's watch. This is Phil. It can get very chaotic down here during a busy time. We have machinery moving, trucks moving, trying to park, coming out. It is my responsibility to make sure that uh, no one's crashing into one another, trucks are getting where they need to be, and everyone's working as safe as possible. A truck is arriving every minute, so Phil has a very hands-on approach when it comes to managing the traffic. First and foremost, cone. This is like our bread and butter. When I do this symbol to a driver, they know to go to the very first lane designated by the cone set down on the ground. New line, don't double up. If I'm asking for a big truck, I have my arms outstretched. If I need one of the little guys or the residential guys, put my hands close together. The cone, the spread eagle, and not forgetting the tap. Up top. Tapping your hard hat has a couple different meanings depending on the truck. For this guy, it means go to the top lift. A lift is a specific spot where trash will be dumped today before getting covered tonight. We have a top and a bottom lift today. It allows us to dump more trash more efficiently. We have to structure it in such a way that it's uh, stable, I guess would be the way to phrase it, stable. With 450 feet of trash below Phil's feet, stability is everything. Especially when it's constantly getting higher. Around my second year here, I really took a good look around and I realized how much the landscape had changed. We had gone up uh, in elevation, maybe a solid 40 to 60 feet in only a few years. I've seen people throw out entire lives wedding photos, you know, all kinds of stuff. Even though you see sad things like that, keepsakes being thrown out, you can't dwell on it. There's always another truck that needs to be parked, so life moves on. <laughs> and the next truck that needs Phil's handy direction is David's. David may be a pro, but dumping 12 tons of moving trash can lead to disaster. Back door open. If you go sideways a little bit, it's really dangerous because you can flip to the side and you don't want that. It looks like it's already done, so. See you guys. As David knows from his travels with the trash, some people will try their best to sneak on the garbage truck what they're not allowed. 
But here at the landfill, there's a team dedicated to seeking it out. As more and more of this morning's trash arrives, the detective work falls to the masked man. Waste inspector, Chris. I'm the guy in blue. I had the face mask on for dust. I don't want it in my lungs, so I, I just try to keep covered. Here's some potatoes. R2-D2. I'm looking for hazardous materials. I'm looking for electronics, chemicals, paints, asbestos, appliances, any kind of a tank that has any kind of gas in it. They end up mixing in here. You were talking about a chemical fire. These are items that we need to keep out of uh, the landfills for the protection of the environment, but also for our employees. A fire on a landfill site could rage for weeks. And it's not long before Chris finds something sinister lurking in the trash. Found a propane tank, which is uh, very flammable, very combustible. And I've seen it happen where a dozer ran over propane tanks, exploded, and it'll lift that right off the ground. The landfill will be the forever home for most of the stuff here. But for the lucky few, there's a route to another life. We want to limit the recyclables that come into the landfills. Anything that's electronic that would have a circuit board in it, there's metals in here and there's, and, uh, there's plastics, stuff that could be recycled. To say this wouldn't be most people's dream job is an understatement. But for the mass man, there's no place he'd rather be. I like being out in the field. I'm a field guy. I don't want to be in an office. I feel like my calling's right here. My heart's right here. It's in the trash. And it's a love affair that's about to get tested. At the front gate, a load has just arrived that's causing concern for Mimi. Radiation. A truck has set up the radiation alarm at the gate. No mask needed here. This job requires a more technical piece of kit. It picks up radiation uh, more rapid and it'll pinpoint it for me too. So what I'm doing is I'm just trying to locate it again. Radiation can be deadly to humans and contaminate land for hundreds of years. There's no way Chris can let the truck into the landfill until he's found out what's in there. You'll hear an alarm on this. When I pinpoint it, there'll be an alarm. Did you hear that? There's our detection right there. With radiation confirmed in the truck, Chris thinks he knows what it can be. It's uh, probably uh, iodine. It's a uh, medical waste, which is found in a diaper or human feces. It can't be disposed of here at the, at the county landfill. Some treatments in hospital can transfer radiation through a patient's body, so it's a common find. But to be sure, the truck's radioactive contents must be sent to a specialist site to be identified and disposed of safely. Thank you. Thank you. Job done. Back down on the active site, it's 11 a.m. Just hang tight. Landfill operations supervisor Nathan is in charge of the whole force. But for the next stage in the afterlife of what we chuck away, it's these extra large dozers that are boss. Daily, we utilize about four trash dozers. Typically, I have two on the bottom, two on the top. The trash must be moved to certain areas to be buried. And it's a job that's perfect for these beasts. Each one weighs in at 72 tons, 
and under the hood is 579 horsepower, five times more powerful than the average car. It's super strength that's needed to drive its huge Caterpillar tracks. Trash is the hardest thing on the bulldozers. To replace all this undercarriage is $200,000, so it's very expensive. It's roughly done every year. And with thousands of tons of garbage to shift every day, these dozers, or trash cats, need a supersized shovel. This one's about roughly 20 feet, the largest in the industry, and this enables it to be able to push a large amount of trash, almost a, an entire transfer load. That's 20 tons in just one push, or 60 if you get a few friends to help. So right now you can see them triple pushing. You can see how much trash they've just cleared off the landing with basically one push. These machines are so gigantic, they literally make the ground move. It's not solid. The landfill's constantly settling. So you never feel an earthquake at the landfill. It just shakes it up. It's like a big bowl of jello. Even when today's trash has been moved into position, it can't be buried yet. Our whole existence is about squeezing as much trash into this site as possible. And to do that, every bit of air around the trash needs to be eliminated. Javier or David, one of you guys need a comfortable top landing. It's a job for this metallic monster the compactor. With its immense 62 tons of weight, it stomps across the mountains of trash moved by the dozers, pummeling it into the ground. And you wouldn't want to find yourself on the receiving end of these. The wheel is made of steel. They're about five and a half feet tall. There's 35 spikes on each uh, wheel. And that's how you get the compaction of the trash. Adrian has operated a compactor for 31 years. If you're not careful, it's a very dangerous piece of machine that if you don't focus on what you're doing, you can even kill yourself or kill other people. Although it does have its upsides. Very fun. I mean, it's, that's the reason why I've been doing it for 30, 31 years already. This machine isn't just about brute force. It also has brains. We have a GPS system that will help you a lot. Both Adrian and the Dozer team have this tech in their cabs that tells them exactly where to move it and precisely how far down to compact it. But how does it do it? All right, Kevin, you want to grab the drone? All right. Up in the hills, way above Adrian and the team, engineers Kevin and Christian are using the latest drone tech to give the guys all the details they need to move and pummel the trash. There you go, pilot. Thanks. The surface here is constantly changing. What we do is take the drone, fly it, and using a technology called photogrammetry, it's actually able to map this surface for us. Safety checks complete, okay. the drone can take to the skies. So there it goes. The drone gets you within one centimeter accuracy. Rely on uh very advanced GPS technology around here. With this drone to work at its accuracy, it needs the space station to be set up on a control point. It's referencing all the GPS satellites that are up in space and correcting the drone position with the satellite positions. But it's not all about the practicalities. To be honest, we don't always do the, uh, the pre-programmed flight path. Sometimes we, we have a little fun with it. Thanks to the drone, Kevin and Christian now have enough data to feed back to the team on site. This surface here, we'll send it out to the machines and that will help them to build the next trash lift. The most important thing is, is utilizing airspace in the landfill. 
Um, so doing these designs helps to make sure that we, that we utilize every cubic foot that we're authorized to use. As morning turns to afternoon, Adrian and the team haven't stopped. But high above them, there's another crucial squad getting ready for work. So this is my crew here. That's Wendy in the back squawking. She's saying, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. I've been working on that line all week. <laughs> Al is the resident bird man and his crew of raptors trump any monster truck when it comes to dealing with the biggest pest on site, seagulls. For the seagulls, it's a smorgasbord. It's just free food for seagulls. When I started here six years ago, you wouldn't have even been able to see the trash down there. It would just be a moving mass of seagulls. And all these, these guys down here, they were just getting peppered with bird poop. But it's not just a shower of seagull poo that's the concern. The scavengers cause much bigger problems. The seagulls will carry trash off, fly out over the public areas out here in the housing districts and stuff. They drop their trash. We come up here with predators and make this a dangerous area for the seagulls to be. We're not here to kill seagulls, we're here to scare seagulls. Time for Wendy to take to the skies. Should we take that off? And there she goes. Here she comes. Go on, go on. Add a girl. These remarkable birds of prey are the perfect hunting machines. Not only do they have eyesight eight times better than ours, but once they've spotted their prey, they can enter a killer glide of 50 miles per hour. As Wendy is giving the local seagulls a run for their money, Al keeps Falcon B warmed up. This is training. So she knows if she catches this lure, she's gonna get fed. Oh, which she just did. There it is. You'll notice she's got her wings spread out and her tail spread out and she's hunching over the whole thing because she doesn't want any of the other predators in the area to see that she's caught something. So she's hiding it. Well, Wendy's job seems to be done and the guys are safe from the poop for another day. Instead of having our flocks of 5,000 like we had six years ago, an average flock for us is about 60 to 80 seagulls in the afternoon. Back down on the active site, and it's time for this morning's garbage to disappear. The whole site may get covered with tarps at the end of the day, but as soon as an area reaches capacity, it's time for it to be sealed with dirt. This is one of the biggest machines here in the landfill. This machine is called the scraper and it certainly lives up to its name. Slicing wedges of earth to bury trash, as well as hauling dirt round site. This afternoon, operator David is tucking up the trash with one of these mighty machines. And just like his ride, he has a nickname of his own. Smiley. And I got that nickname 21 years ago as a laborer. I think I did something wrong directing traffic. I didn't answer. They said smiley, and it stuck for 21 years. Even if I'm mad at somebody, I still smile at them. <laughs> to stand any chance of moving a mega load that weighs the same as two garbage trucks, the scraper has not one, but two engines. Transferring this double power into actual movement on the landfill means the scraper has some serious rubber. So this tire 
It's about nine feet tall. Brand new, this tire cost $15,000. And Smiley has pushed these wheels to their limits. My rookie years, I popped three tires in one night. I went over a, a Christmas tree stumps and I parked it. The next morning, they were all flat, three of them. Yeah, $45,000 worth of damage. I thought they were gonna fire me. <laughs> Showtime. But sometimes even giant tires and two engines won't do. To scrape up even more dirt, Smiley needs a hookup. With two scrapers, instead of two engines, is four engines. Saves time, and time is money. Once you get it, it's just like dancing. You go forward, backwards. A colossal 100 tons of earth moved in just five minutes. But Smiley's not the only one delving into the dirt. Melissa is a fossil hunter. And here in California, every landfill site must have one on call in case any prehistoric residents decide to pop up. Here alone, 20,000 fossils have been dug up from the dirt. While the machinery is coming around and moving dirt, we walk behind it or we stand off to the side to see if we can find any fossils. And if they do find something, it can stop work in its tracks. Our job is to get it out as quickly as possible. So a project that would take a school or a museum an entire summer, we would have to do in, you know, two weeks. The fossils are the oldest secret of the landfill. And there's so many, you can literally trip over them. OK, can we stop? Because I just found a whale vertebra. That's hilarious. It's right here if you want to get a close-up of it. It's a little bit different color than the sediment surrounding it, so it stands out. And you can actually see the, the pores in the, in the bone. So uh, this is kind of exciting. <laughs> it may look just like a rock, but if this is confirmed as a fossil, it will join the many others Melissa and her team have found on this patch. There's another chunk of bone right here. But how did a whale end up here in the hills of the landfill, 20 miles from the coast? This area was underwater probably between about 25 and 7 million years ago. But the land has been uplifted, so now it's 1,500 feet above the ocean. It's 2 p.m. and the Californian sun is heating up the mega landfill. Here, temperatures can reach more than 30 degrees Celsius and with high heat comes danger for the team. Dust. If it's not kept in check, it can cause mayhem, blinding and choking the workers on the ground. Try to keep the dust down, or they get to eat the dust. All day, every day, water is blasted from the truck to dampen down the dust. But this water isn't from the tap. Within the layers of trash, the decomposing garbage creates liquid called leachate that's hoovered up and sent to the tank farm. Along with groundwater, together, this affectionately called trash tea is then recycled by Big Cat back on site. And with an empty truck, he needs to top up his tank quickly before the dust starts to cause mayhem. Get 
getting uh, groundwater, getting about 400 gallons a minute. And just like a good copper needs milk, this trash tea needs topping up with lovely leachate. But there's no Earl Grey aroma for this special blend. Uh, leachate water does not smell good. Really, really don't smell good at all. Not a good smell. Like, like a guy uh, not going in the shower for a month or so. After 31 years, I can't smell nothing no more. But there are some people who aren't just okay with the smell, they're drawn to it. My speaker system is not working today. Are you, are you able to hear me okay back there? That's great. Big Cat and the team are about to get an audience. So right now we're driving on trash. Everything to the left of us and everything to the right and below of, of us is trash. You won't find it in your holiday brochure, but once a week, the landfill opens its doors to people from all over the world. And this afternoon, Wiener is their guide. You guys see these tarps rolled up on their spools right here? They'll use that to cover up the trash tonight. No one realizes what goes on in a landfill. For them, they throw away their trash, the trash truck comes and picks it up, and it's out of sight, out of mind. They just want it gone. Well, time for them to see where it all ends up. All right. Alan, just watch your step. There's a handle right here. OK. Does it smell like trash yet? It does now. <laughs> We're downwind, so that all the smell is coming our way. It is pretty disheartening to see what people throw away. I think we can reuse more and reduce what we throw away, which means if we put more thought into that, that means our landfills last longer. Very few people have seen the landfill this close, and it looks like they're impressed. I'm amazed that they can do all this. I, I had no idea. I live not far from here, and. I'm just amazed. What shocks me about the place is it's so busy. And this is every day. And we're even standing on trash right now. We're at one landfill. Imagine the state, the country, countries, every day, the amount of trash that's accumulated. In Pakistan, the landfills look like apocalyptic wastelands. Like there's uh, smoke coming up, and there's, of course, gases coming up. Oh, it's so much better. I'd like to come back and take another tour sometime. It's so nice when I have visitors come and they recognize all the work that goes on in a landfill. Oh my gosh, I see a seagull. There is. <laughs> oh, where's that falcon? I want to see that falcon. As soon as the tour is over, Weena has another job to do at the landfill. She's the resident biologist, and all that trash talk has her running late. Sorry, I'm running late. Okay. So are these the last few plants you got? Yeah. In California, there's a lot of protected wildlife, plant life that are threatened or endangered. Whenever their habitat is removed, I have to compensate for its destruction and replace it somewhere, restore plant life, restore habitat. Today, the team are planting up a new area to replace one destroyed by the landfill's expansion. Healthy plant. Yep, we can plant this one. And the law says if this work isn't done, the landfill won't be allowed to run is California state law. What you see planted today is in replacement to something that was the home to a bird species or a lizard. Right now, it's brand new container plants. There is a delay in the compensation that we're doing. So we're doing whatever we can to put it back. 
So far, Wiener's team have recreated 14% of what used to be here before the landfill. And their efforts have reaped rewards, bringing many rare species back to the area. When I do encounter protected species, it makes my heart twitter. It brings me joy to see these protected species flourishing, even if it is on a landfill. But it will be a long time before things are as good as new. We'll do our best to put the landfill back into the natural environment, but it'll look like a puzzle piece. It'll look just a little bit different. Given 100 years time, 200 years time, perhaps it will absorb back in and look the same. Wiener's not the only one on site getting green fingered. On a hill not too far away. We get the stuff. It doesn't look much, but administration manager Isaac and director Tom have high hopes for this humble pile of compost. What you see behind me is the pilot, but this area will really be the cornerstone of green waste composting here in Orange County. Just over a third of all the trash brought on site is food and green waste that causes lots of greenhouse gases. By composting it instead, it's better for the environment and they'll save up to a whopping 20% of space. But this rotten idea does have its risks. Phase one will cover 200 tons per day. We'll have a, a flat pad and uh, fire extinguishers surrounding the pad, supported by uh, two 100,000 gallon water tanks. The pile can combust, and we are in a canyon area on a high fire location. We want to make sure that we don't have any situations where the compost can combust, so we have to water that pile if it gets too warm. So before they supersize their plans, it's crucial they know their cooking times. You want to see that compost around 131 to 160. Um, and th right now, this pile is about 145. And it's looking like a perfect bake. But here's a little bit. This is what we have so far. If all goes to plan, there soon should be more room at the landfill and tons of compost for the locals. That's if they can keep careless consumers in check. We're getting glass, plastics, um, a lot of different materials that it's not green waste. One of the challenges that we have is to make sure that people are throwing away the right things and recycling the right things, because once the waste is buried, uh, it's there forever. And what we're doing today isn't just for us. We're doing this for generations to come. As the day creeps forward at the mega landfill, so does the wall of waste. It's hard to believe, but this site, bigger than Disneyland, is running out of space. And with less and less landfills being allowed to open in California, the team need to use up every bit of it they can. It's a huge mega structure that we're building here. It's almost like an architect that's designing it. It's constantly being built like a mega skyscraper. Step forward this team of hard hat heroes who have a mega plan for the mega landfill. Ah, so this is a good vantage point to take a look at where we're going. Here's the ADA excavation plan that we're doing. Kevin and his team are getting ready for a trash takeover on an epic scale. This whole large area is the landfill. So all of the area behind me, all of the area over there, all of that is going to be filled with waste and actually be 100 feet above us. So where we're standing right now, we're going to be 100 feet below trash. There's just an awful lot of space to place trash, but it is filling up, you know, quicker than you'd think. And it's far from as simple as filling a hole. A landfill is an engineered design. There's a lot of engineering, a lot of very serious thought put into it. That includes dealing with four landslides to take this site to the next level. When we originally had the landslide in 2002, it was moving probably about a foot a day. Since then, we've actually spent close to $100 million uh, trying to stabilize the whole hill. 
They're literally making mountains so they can get in more trash. One of the big problems is that we have soil that we remove and we have to find a place to put the soil. And so if you look at that hill over there, we're actually gonna place five million cubic yards of dirt on top of that hill so that we can then take the trash and place it there. It's an unbelievable feat that when the site is projected to be full in 2053, could see their homemade canyon squeeze in another 20 years of waste. It won't ever leave here. Or is there a chance of escape? Back on the current site, today's trash will soon be mingling with residents who've been here for decades. And they're constantly sneaking out as methane gas. The gas from the decomposing mass down below is pumped 24-7 through 45 miles of pipes from under the ground to a state-of-the-art electricity power plant on site. And today, just like every day, it's on a mission. We're actually pulling the methane off the landfill and we're cleaning it up and then we're sending it over to the engines to produce electricity. The tech is so advanced to transform the trash, it only needs four people to run it. One of them is Brian. Time to power up. We start the engine up, it gets up to speed. The red means that the breaker is closed and that we're generating electricity. The green means that this breaker is open, is not allowing electricity to go through. It's fairly simple, fairly simple. So if we had a problem, we basically shut down the plant from home. This whopping engine and generator create enough power for 26,000 local homes. Well, I know that a lot of people look at landfills and, and have a frown on their face, but we've been able to do something special here. You have to send your trash somewhere, and we're making the most out of it and doing something special. It's 5 p.m., and as the last garbage truck leaves, the team can finally put today's trash to bed. Just imagine if we didn't push trash somewhere, the streets would be dirty and gross. In the last 10 hours, nearly a million trash bags worth of garbage has been dropped, dozed, bashed, and buried. What used to be a canyon is now on its way to becoming a mountain. From time to time, I go to some higher elevation points, just at amaze at the size and what we handle every day. It's an epic necessity for millions of people. It's a way for society to get rid of stuff. So it's out of sight, out of mind, but it means people don't think about what they throw away. And it won't be here forever. They think landfills are a endless commodity and it is a finite resource. But until that happens, there's always a home here for the trash that never stops. <laughs>